I, by just uh, um, <laughs> introducing ourselves, we're, um, we're a husband and wife team of neurologists um, and neuroscientists. We see patients in the clinic and in the hospital, and we ha also have the privilege of working in the community. Um, and we're leading currently the largest community-based brain health research uh, with Beach Cities Health District in the Beach Cities of Southern California. And thank you so much for having us. Uh, we're excited to talk to you guys about the importance and the profound impact of lifestyle on brain health and on Alzheimer's prevention. Yeah, so um, what's important for us to know is that we have an effect, we have control over this most important of all organs, our brain. In fact, the rest of the organs, we kind of, and jokingly to other doctors say, are there just to carry the brain. The brain <laughs> is who we are. Um, and it's not just at the point we should be worried about at the point when you already have memory problems, but actually even before then. But the beauty of this whole thing is that we have control over what will happen to the brain at any stage. So let's start with this brain. It's uh, three pounds, 2% uh, of body's weight. It has nearly a quadrillion connections, 87 billion neurons. It has incredible power, way more than what we use it for. And that's where the secret lies, that connectivity, that redundancy, that power can give us tremendous protection. But we have to do some, a, a, approach it in a more systematic way, which is what you're going to learn here during this, uh, this hour. Um, the answer is not going to be in one pill, uh, you know, those late night shows where blue jellyfish pill or, <laughs> or one vitamin or one even nutrient like blueberries. It's going to be a little more comprehensive but the, but the product is incredibly imp empowering. But before we get to the truly powerful capacity or the capacity that we have as individuals to influence outcome and to have control of our aging, brain aging, we have to deal with this tsunami, this uh, dementia. Dementia is an umbrella category. Dementia stands for any cognitive decline that has progressed to the point where the person can uh, has difficulty with certain daily activities or they can't do them anymore. They, be it driving, be taking care of your their finances, be taking care of their medications or phone calls. When somebody has difficulty, cognitively has difficulty, not because of their lack of vision or, or dexterity, but cognitively or thinking wise has a difficulty doing those tasks. By definition, that's dementia. But there are many types of dementias. The biggest category is Alzheimer's, 60 to 70% of all dementias is Alzheimer's, but there are many other types. Lewy body dementia, uh, Parkinson's dementia, frontotemporal lobe dementia, vascular dementia, Huntington's dementia, many. Alzheimer's is the biggest one, 60 to 70%. Um, it's the fastest growing epidemic, um, well, until uh, COVID uh, in, the, in the West. Um, er, right now, the, every time I should I give this talk, the numbers have to be adjusted. The number is actually 6 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's currently. And every 64 seconds, somebody's diagnosed with Alzheimer's or other types of dementia. And that's an understatement because a huge percentage of population never reported that the, 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 their parent or grandparents have cognitive decline, assuming that it's part of normal aging. And it's not. We can do something about it. It's the third leading cause of mortality and morbidity in US and number one in UK and Japan, and it will be number one in US and it's going to overwhelm us. Um, uh, currently, uh, like I said, 6 million in US, about 14 million worldwide, and it will be about 45, actually 45 million uh, 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 worldwide, uh, and it will be more than 135 million by 2050 worldwide. That's, that's remarkable numbers. The cost is um, even more bewildering, as if the suffering at the individual and family level wasn't bad enough. Uh, it's the costliest disease in the world, uh, whereas the second costliest disease, heart disease, is $125 billion in U.S. Uh, Alzheimer's direct and indirect cost combined is more than $500 billion. And that number will climb beyond, this is as $1.1 trillion, that's direct cost beyond 3 trillion altogether by 2050, which will collapse not just our healthcare system, but our entire system if we don't do something about it. Now, the, uh, some statistics, one in 10 people over age 65 have dementia. 
But we worry about not just dementia, but cognitive decline, because at that stage, we can do a lot about it. And that number doubles every 10 years until at age 85, nearly 45% of individuals have dementia. Sorry, 50% have dementia. And that disparity actually continues with, uh, uh, in other ways as well. Women are at twice the risk as men as far as developing dementia in their life. African-Americans and Hispanics, the same thing. So there is a disparities. And ironically, uh, much of those disparities have to do with the public health measures that can be avoided as opposed to you know, intrinsic to the, you know, to the gender or to race. It's more lifestyle and environmental factors that we can influence. Sorry. No problem. So uh, like I said, it's the costliest disease right now. And before we go to what we can do, we have to dispel certain myths. If we don't dispel myths, they will linger and they will stop us from progress. One of the biggest myths, which are now everybody accepts, is that Alzheimer's cannot be prevented. That's false. We know that for more than 80 to 90% of individuals who are at risk of developing Alzheimer's, it can be avoided. Um, or the fact that Alzheimer's starts with symptoms of forgetfulness. It doesn't start with forgetfulness. It starts years earlier. So the sooner you institute the, 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 the kind of changes that we talk about, the more likely that you will uh, you know, avoid it. Uh, but even when you have memory issues, we can significantly avoid or slow it down. Uh, the other one is that there will be one medication for treatment. No, the answer to this is not going to be but in one medication, but a more comprehensive approach to the disease. And lastly, that's a genetic disease. And whenever people say that, they mean it as though to say it's genetic, so we can't do something, anything about it. That's not, that's not true. All diseases are to some extent genetic. Some are more genetic, have more penetrance, meaning that if you have those genes, you're more likely to get the disease such as Huntington's disease. Um, if somebody has the Huntington gene on chromosome four, they will get the disease no matter what, uh, especially if, if it's more expressed. With Alzheimer's, that's not the case. In fact, um, for a majority of the cases, it's actually um, uh, non-genetic or genetics have a part in it, but they're not the driving factors. The only 3% of Alzheimer's is driven by the kind of genes that if you have it, you're gonna get the disease. So only 3% of all Alzheimer's are were unavoidable. We actually use the term 90% that can be prevented, but actually it's higher. Um, but in any case, what about the other genes? The other genes are lifestyle genes. ApoE4, the one that's most known, which increases your risk significantly. If you have one gene from one parent, your risk goes up four times. If you have one gene from each parent, your risk goes up by as much as 12 times. But that, still doesn't mean you're going to get it. In fact, 50% of people who have gene two genes for ApoE4 still never get the disease. Why? Lifestyle. And, and the rest of the genes are also related to lifestyle risk. Um, and that's not a negative uh, piece of information. That's actually incredibly empowering. Knowing that genes are not the driver, but we are. Um, that's, that's empowering. So up to now, we have actually failed in our traditional approach by 100%. Every drug that we've used has failed. These drugs have worked on mice models, but when we apply it to humans, they've all failed. So we don't think that at least in the foreseeable future, the answer is gonna be in a pill. The answer is going to be in a comprehensive approach. And prevention is the approach to take. Prevention works not just to avoid dementia, but to maintain cognitive health to maintain vi you know, cognitive vibrancy, vitality, and power well into our 80s, 90s, and beyond. That's in our, in our, our own control. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of data that actually shows us that when you live a certain life, when you live a very healthy life, even though you may have some of the genes for developing dementia, you can actually stop those genes from manifesting. Um, this, this particular uh, research was done in Chicago, Rush University, and they showed that in a population over a period of time, if they had the genetic risk for dementia, their risk of developing dementia later on in life was 60%. However, if these individuals had the genetic risk and the unhealthy lifestyle, their risk of developing dementia went up by 360%. Now that's an additional 300% added to what they 
uh, what the genetic risk only contributed. That shows the impact of an unhealthy lifestyle if people have the genes for it. But if the same kind of the genetic pool was looked at from a healthy lifestyle perspective, the risk of developing dementia uh, fell to less than 30%. So that's the impact of a healthy lifestyle and adherence to it can offset genetic risk. It doesn't activate those genes. So uh, our research, uh, both in Loma Linda and beyond, has repeatedly shown that there are four main pathways to disease. Lipid dysregulation, glucose dysregulation, um, oxidation, and inflammation. People don't get to this step um, uh, one of them, it, it, it all most often involves multiple steps, but irrespective, these are the steps or pathways that lead to cognitive decline in dementia. So how do you influence these things? Inflammation, glucose dysregulation, lipid dysregulation, and oxidation? Well, fairly simple. Nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep, and we'll get into all of these, and then mental activity. So it was with that that we came up with this um, acronym, um, uh, NEURO, which is N-E-U-R-O. It's self-serving because we're neurologists, but it's also easy to remember. And as for nutrition, and we'll talk about what specific nutritional areas are helpful. Aisha is a neurologist and a stroke specialist and has done her research, a master's in uh, uh, epidemiology and nutrition. But while in Columbia University, she actually in the morning would go to uh, ICUs and at night would go to cooking class. Right. Because, because if you can't provide nutritious food or and tasty food for people, it's not going to work. And at the core of our research in beach cities is nutrition. And we teach how to create the healthy food, how to maintain it, how it's done so it doesn't feel extra work, but actually it's part of normal flow. It is critical that, that we institute that, not at the, at the end, uh, you know, uh, individual level, but at the community level. And we're hoping that beach cities will become worldwide model. In fact, we know it will be. Yeah, absolutely. Second component is exercise. And we'll talk about that. Third is unwind, which is about good stress and bad stress. Yes, you heard it right. Good stress. It's as critical as bad stress. And we'll talk about how management of that is at the core, at the center of all of this. R is restorative sleep, which means not just being knocked out with some medicines, but really going through the deep cycles of sleep multiple times a night, which is incredibly important. And lastly, and not least, is optimize, which is cognitive and social activity that grow the brain the most. So we will talk about all of these and how we hope to institute it in Beach City's Health District and through our study. And for those of you that are interested, would love for you guys to participate in this study. It's, it's you get... I mean, incredible support, coaching, information on a weekly basis to basically change your life. Um, so um, we will talk about how you can participate in that and connect with us. Um, and with that, we will start with nutrition. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll be speaking about nutrition and um, I'll try to keep it brief and give you an updated or a summarized version of what we know so far as far as food's relationship with brain health. Now, um, this is the kind of food uh, that seems to be very healthful for the brain and unprocessed mostly plant-based foods and a variety of them uh, because they provide the right kind of nutrients, whether it's carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, or micronutrients like um, vitamins and minerals. And it's important for us not to be uh, very focused on one vitamin or one nutrient or one superfood, so on and so forth. It doesn't work that way. Every food has, all of these plant foods have their own strengths. And if you focus on eating a specific dietary patterns, you're going to get all of it in a beautifully synergistic way. Um, now, as far as research goes, we know from all kinds of uh, studies that have been done, there are epidemiological studies, there are clinical trials, there are case series, and there's some molecular research that shows that foods that are unprocessed and mostly plant-based seem to be the best uh, brain foods out there. Uh, one should focus on elimination of meat and other sources of saturated fats. So all fats are not bad, but the, the, the kind of fat that seems to be harmful, that seems to increase inflammation and oxidation, as Dean was uh, mentioning earlier, seems to be meat, 
cheese, and dairy. And these fats cause damage to the brain cells as well as the blood vessels that supply oxygen and nutrition to the very sensitive parts of the brain. Remember, the brain is the most active organ in our body and it consumes a lot of energy. So whatever food we eat can either make the brain or it can break the brain. It sounds a little ominous, but food is the most important environmental factor for our brain. So it's important for us to focus on making sure that we eat the best foods. The other thing that seems to be harmful for brain are refined carbohydrates. So these are sources of carbohydrates that have been stripped away from a lot of its nutrients and fiber. We're talking about things like white pasta, white bread, white rice, as opposed to say, for example, whole wheat pasta or whole grains that haven't really been uh, you know, uh, stripped out of their bran or their covering and uh, brown rice, for example. Those are great because they have a lot of B vitamins and fiber, but refined carbohydrates, what they do is they raise your blood sugar level very quickly and the brain and the body doesn't know what to do with all that sugar. And so it causes a lot of inflammation and oxidation. On the other hand, if you eat unrefined carbohydrates, that's one of the best sources of energy for our brain and the body. Now, now, I wanted to make sure that we are not uh, reductionist and focus on specific foods, but there are certain foods that kind of stand out. Even when they do research, when they look at a variety of different foods, they look at what kind of foods stand out and are on the top when it comes to their um, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant characteristics. And these foods are things like berries, green leafy vegetables, beans or lentils, nuts and seeds, and of course, whole grains as well. If we consume these foods on a regular basis, something that we call neuro nine, which are nine foods that are great for the brain, these include whole grains, nuts and seeds, vegetables, fruits, crucifers like um, broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, spices and teas. If you consume these, then the brain has the right kind of foods, the right kind of nutrients, and it doesn't really go into a frenzy and cause diseases like stroke, Alzheimer's dementia, and even others like Parkinson's disease. So in summary, a whole food, which means an unprocessed plant-based diet is the most optimal diet for the brain. Now we understand that a lot of us are not there. What we're actually talking about is the optimal diet for the brain. But every small step towards that ultimate optimal diet helps. So say, for example, if you or if someone is trying to eat healthier and they're not doing it right now, finding out one thing that they can change makes a huge difference. One of my research actually showed that the stepwise increase in healthy foods also makes a huge difference as far as stroke prevention is concerned. And the same goes for Alzheimer's disease. So elimination of sugar, elimination or reduction of saturated fats, elimination or reduction of added salt in our diet, elimination or reduction of the bad kind of fats coming from meat, cheese, and dairy, they all work. Now, saturated fat specifically is associated with insulin resistance and inflammation. And that's why foods that have high saturated fats, including coconut oil, I must say, cause insulin resistance or associated with insulin resistance and inflammation. Coconut oil is one of the plant oils that is very, very high in saturated fats, 90% plus uh, saturated fats as opposed to other kinds of fats. So reduction in coconut oil is important. And then vitamins and nutrients are best derived from food and not from supplements. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to find a quick fix for things, you know, mm -hmm. for brain health or general health. The body doesn't work that way. We can't really hack ourselves to a good brain or to a good um, health in general. We have to do the right things. And food seems to be the best form of these vitamins and nutrients. And it's not the vitamin of the day. So um, there are specific things that we have to pay attention to. Don't focus on one vitamin or one food. That's the reductionist approach. And when we do so, we are going to give ourselves the right kind of an environment for the brain to function optimally. Now let's talk about exercise. So exercise, we all know is important, uh, but how much and what kind? And the research when it comes to brain is becoming more and more lucid and, 
and, and we're beginning to learn more about it. Um, so the brain actually grows with exercise, whereas nutrition, stress management, and sleep create the environment for the brain to thrive. Exercise and mental activity as well optimize, but exercise actually grows the brain. Study after study after study have shown when people at any age started ex exercising, they actually grew the brain, specific parts more than others, but especially the hippocampus, especially the frontal lobe, which are the two important, you know, memory and judgment centers. So it is critical to exercise. Now, by exercise, we don't mean, and we we have yeah. patients come to us, oh, Dr. Sherza, we're fine. I don't, you don't need to talk to me about exercise. So what do you do? Oh, I walk the neighborhood and I, you know, walk around the house a lot. And, you know, I garden. Those are great. Those are all meditation. We're talking about significant exercise that tires you out, that you get short of breath every day. How much aerobic exercise or the kind that pumps up the heart and you're short of breath? About 150 minutes per week, up to 25 to 30 minutes, five to six times a day, one day for rest. It's critical. And, and how, how do we know how much? Well, if you're getting short of breath, that's a good measure. You don't have to do, you know, mathematical gymnastics where you, you know, measure, you know, get your pulse at the rate of the heart and then subtract your age and multiply by one. No, <laughs> if you're short of breath, uh, if you're tired, that's a good exercise. Right. So about 25 to 30 minutes a, a day, five to six days a week, and a total of 150 minutes or more. Uh, that's aerobic. The other part of uh, exercise that's important is move, move all day. Create an environment in your uh, community and at your home where movement and standing up and stretching is a part of normal day. If you have to contrive it, if you have to get up and get dressed and go to a gym, well, if you do that, more power to you, but it's less likely to happen. Make your home an exercise conducive environment. Make your job, your work, an exercise conducive environment where you're standing, you're, you're, you're stretching all the time, doing these kind of things that, that, that really exercise you in a natural way. And, and data shows that people who exercise even in a half an hour a day, but then they become recumbent for four to five hours at a time they nullify all that benefit. So move throughout the day. And the third one is leg strength. Of all the strengthening exercises, by the way, all of them are important, uh, especially for avoiding uh, uh, pain, avoiding chronic little pains, avoiding uh, injury. But the leg strength is by far the most important for multiple reasons. Uh, I'll tell you some of the other reasons. Number one reason that people end up in the hospital when they grow, uh, when, as we get older, is falls. Right. The number one thing that avoids falls is leg strength. Balance, the same thing. But the other reason is people who have bigger legs have bigger brains. People who actually build up their leg strength, they actually develop greater uh, blood flow to the brain. They actually increase the amount of what's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a growth hormone for the connections to the brain. So at multiple levels, it's extremely important. Now, when I say leg strength, you could do steps, you could do bicycling, you could do squats, but I, I, I prefer mini squats. I don't, prefer, I don't think that putting weights on your shoulder and doing squats is good, but mini squats, as you're standing watching TV, doing little 60 degree mini squats continuously, that strengthens the legs, that builds the brain. That's it. Those three elements are at the core of exercise. And the more you do it, the more resilience and protection and growth you'll build into the brain. The next one is stress. Stress is at the center of our program. You know, physically, and I mean, structurally at the center of neuro is you. We, we use the word unwind, but it's because it's not just about bad stress, but it's about good and bad stress. The brain needs to be challenged. That's a type of stress. It needs to be pushed. If it's not pushed, especially as we get older, it actually withdraws and shrinks. So you got to keep the brain challenged. That's good stress. Any kind of activity that pushes your brain, that has direction, that has tangible, measurable, achievable successes, that has you know, a, a path and it almost becomes like a game is good stress. Taking new class, you know, uh, learning a new musical instrument. And we'll talk about this more in the optimized section. Anything that's not driven by your purpose, that doesn't have clear directions, clear victories, and goes on and on and on, is bad stress. The pathway through which those two systems work on the brain and the body is well known now. 
Good stress is identified by your limbic system, which sends a different set of information to the hypothalamus, which sends a different set of chemicals to the pituitary, and then the rest of the body experiences that product. If it's good, it actually is stabilizer of your all your hormones, growth hormone, insulin hormone, uh, sexual, sexual hormones, all the hormones in the body, including immune system. If it's bad stress, the whole system is de de uh, discombobulated. So good stress and bad stress is important. And how do we get a control of it? Identify your stressors clearly, measurably on a piece of paper on a, or a whiteboard on a wall. Write them down clearly. And then for bad stressors, reduce, eliminate, and, and disempower the bad stressors. Increase, tool, and empower the good stressors over time. They have to be small enough steps to be able to, and measurable, that you can actually do that. And the power of identifying clearly and then empowering systematically is bewildering. In small increments, you will actually achieve more stress management and for that matter, more, more management of life than you will have ever imagined. So that's what good stress and bad stress is about and it is center. Because if you're not able to manage your stressors, you'll never be able to create a lifestyle around food. It's from diet plan to diet plan and failure to failure. It's from the new year resolution uh, exercise program that fails over and over. It's from sleep being affected by that stress. So it's critical to manage our stress. And then is sleep. That's right. So sleep is probably the most important time in our day. Sleep is incredibly important for brain health. And we basically put ourselves at the perils of nature so that the brain can rest and restore itself during this period. Now, two things happen when we sleep. Isn't that a cute baby, first of all? <laughs> um, two things happen. First of all, our brain cleanses itself of all of the debris that is created during the day because of its activity. So there's a lot of waste products created and we have a system in place in our brain that actually gets activated when we go through the deeper stages of sleep. It doesn't get activated during the daytime. So it's very necessary for us to go through those stages of sleep for the brain cells and that system to get activated and get rid of all the bad proteins and the waste products. It's almost like a team goes into a building and starts cleaning it up when mm -hmm. there's nobody around at night. It's basically just like that. Um, the second thing that happens when we sleep is that our memories get organized and they get consolidated during the different stages of sleep. It's essentially like, you know, you get information, somebody tells you something, and you store it in a small folder, in a working folder, right? It's like a, writing something on a sticky note. And when you sleep, it gets transferred to a well-organized Word document that you put in a file and then you put in a folder in a cabinet. So the next day you know where it is so that all of those memories are not scattered. That happens during the deep stages of sleep. Mm -hmm. People who have sleep disorders or who have disrupted sleep, say, for example, because they might have drank, drank too much coffee or they have to go to the bathroom a lot and they can't go back to sleep or they're just thinking too much and that doesn't allow them to go to sleep, that these processes get affected at various levels. And so it's important for everyone to take sleep very seriously. And first of all, to understand if they have any sleep disorders, getting themselves checked, and then including specific behaviors that comes under the umbrella of sleep hygiene to make sure that their brain has an opportunity to cleanse itself and also for those memories to get organized and consolidated. Sleep is so important and it affects your memory so much that in a recent study that done in Florida University, they showed that in a large population, sleep apnea, which is a condition where people stop breathing in their sleep because the brain doesn't really communicate very well with the respiratory centers, having untreated sleep apnea increased the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 70%. And on the flip side, by just instituting things like a CPAP machine, 
that completely got rid of all of that risk. And it brought the risk the same to the, the general population who didn't have any sleep, sleep, apnea, sleep apnea. So it's important for us to get checked to understand whether we have any sleep disorders and make sleep a priority. You know, we go to different talks, we're invited to these retreats and hotels and so on and so forth. And, you know, people spend so much money talking about their mental health, so on and so forth. The best kind of investment and the best kind of spa that you can have is in your bedroom, having the right kind of pillows, making sure it's dark, making sure it's cool, making sure that there's no noise and, you know, keeping your bedroom just for sleep, getting rid of blue light and TV and noise and not eating in bed. That those are very important and very specific steps that we can talk about in detail, maybe in another session of what that sleep hygiene looks like and what it means. So that was sleep, restorative sleep. And now we come to optimize, which means optimization of cognitive activity for better brain health. Now, <clears throat> this is important because uh, brain has an incredible ability to grow. Let's talk about that capacity. We have, we said we have 87 billion neurons, but each of them, those neurons can make a couple of connections or as many as 30,000 connections. Now look at that power, 87 billion neuron can each make a couple or 30,000, that's profound power. And we have that control in our hands at any age. Studies have shown that people have grown that those connections at, at, in their 80s, 90s and beyond. So how do we do that? mental activity or good stress yeah. around your purpose, uh, challenging and, 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 and complex. I'll describe each of those terms. But before we do that, I'll give you some studies. Here's the London taxi driver study where they actually compared taxi drivers and bus drivers before they got their training and after they got their training. As it happens, bus driving in London, well, this is prior to GPS, was uh, very simple. It's few routes. You very easy memorization. There's not much thinking. Uh, so th they had uh, MRIs and neuropsychological testing and everything before the training and after. Same thing with taxi drivers, which was completely different, very complex. They had to memorize every road, every household. I mean, it's, it's crazy what they had to do for a city. We've been to London, which right. is beautiful, but fairly chaotic. And they measured their brain uh, size, their cognitive capacity before and after the training. And what they found was the taxi drivers that were challenged actually grew their brain, especially their uh, limbic system or the hippocampus, which is the memory centers, as well as the frontal lobe. That is amazing power to have by just doing something that you want to do. It's your purpose for these uh, um, uh, people who were trying to get uh, their uh, driver's license for taxi driving. Uh, it was their purpose. It meant something. It, it meant a livelihood. So they were passionate and driven. And and by the way, they weren't young people. They across age spectrum. So that was one of the few studies that showed that at any age we can grow the brain when we when we do the kind of activities or participate or partake in kind of activities that truly challenge our brain uh, around our purpose. The nun study is another interesting study where several hundred nuns dedicated their time, their, their body, their blood, their brains uh, to science. By, by brains meaning that after they died, uh, you know, they could do autopsies on their brains. And what they found was something incredibly unusual. Now, whenever we do studies, we ask for education as a measure of cognitive activity, because those who have more education have more connectivity. It's called cognitive reserve or brain reserve. And, but, uh, but with nuns, they're the same. So that wasn't a factor. And by the way, they also kept their diaries. And a, a, a percentage of the nuns that passed away, they looked at their brain and what they saw was the brains were incredibly shrunken and had pathology for Alzheimer's and other diseases. Yet this population, this particular population, had not succumbed to dementia. Yet another population of nuns where the brain had not shrunk, there was not as much pathology, yet they had already succumbed to dementia. So what was the difference? What was the factor that determined one developed dementia and not the, not the other? Obviously it wasn't pathology, what was it? When they looked at everything and then they looked at their diaries, they found that the ones that were protected in spite of disease, in spite of Alzheimer's pathology in their brain, they were protected, they never manifested the disease, 
were the ones that had more vocabulary, more complex sentences, much more well-read and you know, cognitively active. So cognitive activity protected you even in lieu of, in spite of pathology. That's amazing. So although the sooner you start in life that cognitive activity, the better, but at any age, when you challenge your brain, it's helpful. Now, in research, like I said, we often use education, but it's not about education. It's about whatever challenges your brain. So we did a meta-analysis, which is a, a huge study. And what we found, there are three variables, purpose, complexity, and challenge. Purpose means participating in kind of activities that you see valuable to you. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to like it, but you find valuable mm -hmm. one. Second, complex. Complex means, okay, things like Sudoku and crossword puzzles are great. They're good. But more complex activities that are real life activities that involve multiple domains of your brain are way better. You know, playing a musical instrument or learning a new musical instrument or learning a new song or learning a new dance or uh, leading a group or volunteering or playing cards with friends or learning a new language or uh, taking a course. All these are multi-domain activities that involve multiple parts of the brain. They challenge you, they push you, and they serve your purpose. So that's the kind of activity that's way more than, you know, Sudoku or, or cost of puzzles. So that's where the value of this comes in. Um, so, and it's important to create habits around this. So we believe that Alzheimer's and dementia and stroke are for the most part preventable. Most cognitive diseases are preventable. The answer is not in one thing. It's in combination of nutrition, good nutrition, mostly plant-centered, exercise, uh, stress management, restorative sleep. We, in our studies, we teach uh, individuals all of these things step-by-step step, and, and mental and social activity. And our study in Beach Cities is a model of that, the largest brain health st study in the country. Right. So the, the premise of, of the study is that, you know, 80 to 90 percent of chron chronic diseases, but especially diseases of the brain, can be averted by applying these habit or behavioral changes in the community. And if they're given the access to all those resources, they are actually going to do amazing. Um, and it's focused on kind of diseases at the individual and community level. As Dean mentioned in the beach cities, that's our flagship study where we're looking at the relationship between environmental risk factors and brain health. And it's a community-based study. We're looking for participants. Uh, we're going to follow them for three years. We have been recruiting a lot. And on a monthly basis, we have sessions on a weekly ba uh, basis. We also have a Q&A and sessions on particular health topics. We have cooking classes. And before and after the study, we uh, collect cognitive test scores. Uh, we work with the participants, uh, primary care physician to get information on their brain MRI, blood tests, and they also fill out lifestyle questionnaires and they follow what we refer to as the neuro plan, which is um, a, an intervention on nutrition, exercise, so on and so forth. And, um, and, and then weekly Q and A sessions with us. Right. And, and that's a lot of fun. Plus cooking sessions with Aisha <laughs> really, and so really much more that, that, that completely, uh, you know, book clubs right. and, Absolutely. and Moais that actually involve you in, in the behavior. So, and this is our team. This is our pre COVID team. That's why we're standing so close to each other. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Um, our dog always gets upset when the mailman is coming. Yeah, he gets excited with the mailman, and we have to uh, control him. Uh, that's the only time he gets excited. Um, again, um, we, sorry, one second. Uh, this is our first book, Alzheimer's Solution, our second book coming out in March. And with the second book, uh, there's a course that's provided for free, everything. Um, and But we're not selling the book, so don't, don't worry about that. But uh, this is a, how you can contact us. 
all of the proceeds of the books go to the Healthy Minds Initiative. So um, if you have any questions, oh, and I wanted to mention that the pre-COVID picture doesn't include uh, Nicole Lundy, who's our fabulous coordinator. Um, she's, uh, she's here uh, in the conversation. So we're going to Photoshop her in this picture. We are. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we invite you to connect with us. Uh, we're at Healthy Minds Initiative on social media. And our website is healthymindsinitiative.org. And if anybody's interested in finding out more about the study, they can contact Nicole Lundy from the BCHD. And you can contact us at uh, dean at healthymindsinitiative.org or Aisha at healthymindsinitiative.org. Right. Or the contact page at healthymindsinitiative.org. All right. That's basically it. And we would be happy to um, take questions. Hold on one second. Let me see. Let me stop sharing. There it is. Okay. We'd be happy to take questions, um, Tama, or whatever you suggest at this point. Okay. Can, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I can answer some of yeah, okay. <clears throat> Sorry, my headset was charging. So, um, yeah, so right now is the time for questions. I do see one question in the chat. Uh, it's coming from Ms. Janice Champion. Her question is, are vitamins bad for us? or just wasteful? Sure. Are vitamins harmful? Uh, the answer is E, all of the above. Uh, so if you don't need vitamins, check your levels, B12, folate, um, uh, vitamin D. The first step is not just supplementation. The first step is why would you have deficiency? Is uh, your vitamin D level low because uh, you know, you're not in the sun enough or there's a, a, a liver problem that's actually causing that? Is your B12 level because your um, uh, microbiome, because of the food you eat is affected, or you're taking certain pills that's blocking the acid, which then would affect absorption. That's the best way to do uh, first. But then taking supplements if need be, absolutely. But if you don't need supplements, there are some studies and in individuals where they had normal levels of vitamins and when they were taking uh, take, took vitamins, their cancer risk went up. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a three-step process, know your levels, and if they're low, find out why. And if you can fix the why, that's great. If you can't fix the why, even, you know, then, especially with changing the food over time and everything else, then and only then take supplements and that then, then it's fine to bring it to normal levels. Absolutely. Um, I can read the questions if you'd like me to. So Nicole said, Nicole asked the same questions about vitamins being bad or wasteful. So hopefully that helped Nicole. No, um, that's Nicole, okay. Yeah, there are two Nicoles. <laughs> Nicole, our Nicole. Um, okay, yeah, she was just mentioning the same vitamin questions. Um, and then Nicole also wanted to ask about the book. Yes, the book is available and we- oh, signed copy. Oh, a signed copy for a giveaway. We can, we can arrange some something like that, especially arrange. for Ollie members, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, Dorothy says, I was told by another vegan group that you need to take vitamin B12 if you follow a vegan diet. What's your opinion? Um, yes, Dorothy, that's, uh, it's, it's important for people who are completely plant-based to uh, keep an eye on their vitamin B12 levels, get it checked um, on a regular basis. And, um, you know, it's not just vegans. A lot yeah. of people are actually vitamin 45%. B12 deficient. Yeah. So, you know, uh, B12 um, seems to be stripped off of our diet, but yes, if people are on an exclusively uh, plant-based diet, uh, a supplement of vitamin B12 is important. As you know, as you may know, vitamin B12 is a very important micronutrient for brain health and nerve health. Um, so um, it's important to, to make sure that you have optimal levels of it. There are three things we talk about that we might need to be supplemented. One is B12, and that not just for vegans, especially vegans, but, but all uh, about 45% of the population seems to be B12 deficient. The second is omega-3, preferably algae-based, but omega-3 is important. We just did one of the largest studies, which is going to be published soon, on developing brain, that's in children and omega-3, and aging brain, that's people over 45 and above, uh, and, and omega-3. And there seems to be evidence for need for supplementation with omega-3. And a third is turmeric. You can take it in food form with, with the spoon, but usually with pepper added because pepperin increases its absorption. Um, uh, but, and turmeric seems to actually bind to amyloid. Our studies at Cedar, Cedar Sinai showed that actually binds to the amyloid, which is the bad protein, and then the body removes it. So those three things, if you're going to do supplementation, though, that's where you would do it. 
Okay, so since there are no questions, I'm going to act for the audience and ask you some questions, or maybe we could actually discuss some of these, uh, you know, very common questions that keep coming up. All right. So the shirt. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this shirt I got. For... Yeah. <laughs> now uh, let's talk about one question that we're asked most of the time, and that's you know people having difficulty letting go of sugar. Why would you talk about yeah. uh, sugar um, to people who uh, are very hooked to it? Speaking from experience, yes, um, and but maybe you should go ahead and talk about yeah, too so much sugar in, in our blood. <clears throat> the two micronutrients that we talk about avoiding is saturated fat and sugar, um, and all sources of saturated fat and all sources of simple sugars. Carb we're not against carbohydrates. We're not against complex carbohydrates. There's a lot of people out there talking about avoid uh, all carbs, and that's not based on science. We're, we're fact, talking about added sugar. Added sugar. So added sugar is uh, terrible for the body because it increases, it, it creates these vacillations of sugar levels in your body, which this, this combobulates every, you at, at the cellular level, especially the cells that are most active, which are the brains. Um, and the second thing is it also creates inflammation. The inflammatory pathway is actually instituted with sugar. So the combination of those are devastating, especially if somebody's consuming large amounts of sugar over longer periods of time. So we say you don't have to avoid sweet foods. I mean, Aisha is a cook, and we uh, she make and we have two kids, so uh, we make all kinds of foods. I have uh, a cake on the cover of our second book. Yeah, but <laughs> but it's got to be healthy, so you can actually replace the sugar with uh, with a, a natural sweeteners that are fiber bound. Why is that important? Because it's how it releases the glucose and how slowly it releases the glucose that's important. Yeah. For example, instead of sugar, you use monk fruit or erythritol or um, paste, um, date paste. Yeah. So so you can or sweeten. fruit paste. Yeah. So so say for example, if you're making muffins, you can sweeten it with bananas, with applesauce, with uh, um, I even actually sweeten it with dates. So we just pulverize dates and make a paste out did of it. Did you guys? Kinda... Did you guys see how how? talented she was and she actually shaped the question so it comes back to her cooking yeah. i'm i'm manipulated just, so easily i love food i yes. love food and the reason i actually went to cooking school was because i love food so she's much she's amazing at it and but, uh, i think we can it's it's a beautiful way of loving your brain through food it, it literally is medicine or poison and that's not a hyperbole so nicole says suggestion on weaning from sugar so that's a very good question yeah. nicole you know i think we all know that added sugar is bad but the most important and the most difficult thing well, I wouldn't, I shouldn't say most difficult thing, but the most challenging thing is weaning off of sugar. And everyone who is used to sugar for the first few weeks and few months of letting go of sugar will feel terrible, terrible. You, you basically get body aches and pains, you get brain fog, you have all the symptoms of withdrawal because our brain gets hooked to that level of sugar. So, you know, doing it in a very graded way where you actually cut down slowly and gradually and, replace. and replacing it exactly so say for example you have to know how much sugar you consume you have to uh, you have to count the packets of sugar you put in your coffee you have to uh, count the the sugars of spoon that are added in your jam or in you know in your peanut butter and you have to find out how much you consume and then cut it into 50 50 percent half and then do that for a couple of weeks and then cut it to 25% and so on and so forth. So you can do it very gradually and that works. Aisha was an addict. I mean, that was her addiction. My mother was meat. Totally. I grew up in Pittsburgh with meat. Um, the first time we met 17 years ago, now 18 pretty much almost. Yes, almost. You had a Mars bar in, in each hand. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> but but uh, she loved her uh, chocolate. In my purse. In her purse, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but uh, but we have had our challenges. Yeah. I mean, I've had the the, uh, the challenge of giving up meat, although it was less challenging than I thought. Right. Um, and 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 uh, slowly we went from um, uh, uh, from um, that to um, uh, healthier foods. So that's the beauty of doing right. it systematically in small, measurable increments, which is right. part of the study. Right. Janice or Janice, I'm sorry, Janice, my friends is, uh, my friend spells her name Janice, like Janice, but we call her Janice. So that's why I just kind of blurred it out. But I think it's Janice. Janice Champion said, what do you think about sugar substitutes like stevia? Mm -hmm. You know, unlike the, the whole lot of information that you hear that, you know, substituted sugars are bad, stevia is actually good. It's not help. It's not harmful in small quantities. Um, so if you want to add a couple of 
packets of stevia to your tea or coffee or beverages, that's fine. The other one that's okay is monk fruit. And you can find it in Costco in big bags now. I'm so excited to see that. That's actually even better than stevia because they've done some research and they think that it actually has an anti-inflammatory effect. So it's good for inflammation. Um, so stevia and monk fruit are good. The one thing that they have questions about is aspartame, but the data on that is also very, very uh, small. You hear a lot of bad things about it, but you know, if you could actually stick to stevia, to monk fruit or erythritol, you know, some of these sugar alcohols, xylitol, erythritol, they're okay. All right. Um, Shell says, how about an evening glass of wine or cocktail? I'm going to leave that to you. Why? Okay. <laughs> because it's complicated. <laughs> okay. The, the amount of <laughs> the amount of alcohol that's good for your brain is zero. Despite the studies coming and all this other stuff, those are very tenuous studies. But having said that, there's a little nuance, and we are all about nuance. Complexity is good. Uh, simplicity is not good. So the complexity of it is, for those who have some anxiety, taking one glass of wine seems to be beneficial, not because of its anti-inflammatory and phenols yeah, and all of that. of that. It's because it reduces anxiety, but one glass. Um, and, and that's one element. The other element of it is um, usually people who drink this, they do so uh, in, in small amounts and in, in convivial environments. And so that's, that's fine at that level. But anything more than that seems to be harmful. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and so that's the, the, the approach that I would take. And may I add that one glass of wine is five ounces. It's not eight or 16, or you could just, you know, for yeah. that. one glass of wine is five ounces. And, um, for, I have to say for women, there've been studies that when you take more than one glass of wine per night, your chances of not only dementia and cognitive impairment, but breast cancer goes up very, very high. So it's important to know. All right. Uh, somebody said, you mentioned turmeric. But right around oh, that sorry. question, we lose half the population. No, no, no. you can have your one glass. Yes, or you can have one glass, yeah. but anything more than that can actually be harmful, unfortunately, because the liver and the body has to work really hard to get rid of that alcohol. Um, and if you see, if you, if you paid attention, most of our cells are made out of fat. And what cuts fat? Alcohol. So it's, it's, it's completely contrary to what our biology is like. And so be very careful with your alcohol intake. And, and by the way, when, uh, when, when you come to this study, it's not about an all or none phenomena. It's stepwise helping people and wherever they Absolutely. end up, but that's their journey. Yeah. We want to make sure that this study is a real life journey a study, not a contrived one. So we work with people to reach their optimal and not the absolute optimal. Right. So, yeah. Absolutely. Last question. You mentioned turmeric. It also was mentioned around COVID-19. Can you expand? I suppose there's been a lot of information thrown out to people about foods that can help you from with the COVID and all that. The data on that is very, very weak. This virus has really thrown us off tracks. And so um, turmeric specifically for brain health is helpful because it binds to the bad protein that causes Alzheimer's disease. And in multiple studies, including our own study in Cedar sinai turmeric kind of just melted away oh, nice. the beta amyloid protein okay. and it helped reduce the burden. So oh, that's yeah. the information on turmeric. Okay, so yeah. All right, we wanna be respectful of the time. I know we are a minute ahead. Thank you guys. I hope uh, that you, um, find this information helpful. We would love for you guys to join this study because it's a community-wide study. And if you know others, 55 and over, who uh, they, 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 that live in the area of Manhattan, Redonda Hermosa, please in, involve them as well uh, because this is the only study of its type in the world for that matter. Thank you all for being with us. It was uh, wonderful to connect with you all. Absolutely. Thank you so much, doctors. I believe that we have another... Um, uh, we'll be having you back on March 22nd. Is that my understanding? That's yes. correct. Yes. On March 22nd, we're going to go into the details of nutrition and exercise and sleep and cognitive activity. So we're going to, we're going to talk more about all of that. More on the how basically. Exactly. More on the how. Okay, perfect. So it is titled avoid Alzheimer's and build a better brain. That's correct. Correct. That's correct. Yes. Okay, so those of you who are interested, here's the information. It's going to be on March 22nd. That's on a Tuesday at 3 o'clock. 
and I could put this information in the chat as well, but I just want to make sure that this group is aware that we're going to be having you doctors once again on March 22nd. <laughs> we're looking forward to it. Thank you very pleasure. much. Thank you so much. Well, this concludes our session. Um, everyone in the chat is saying thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank this you. was very helpful. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Have a wonderful week. Mm -hmm. We'll see you guys soon. Bye. Bye. And Hi. fill out those Thank program you. evaluations. Fill out those program evaluations for us. Let us know your thoughts. Thank you, Nicole.